This is Ryan Womack, Data Librarian at Rutgers University Libraries, and this is part 12 of Data Visualization and R, and this is the final major segment, although I reserve the right to add a couple of maybe bonus features as time permits uh, a little bit later on. I have some ideas there. Uh, this section is focusing on big data, and so big data, obviously a hot topic, uh, but one that impacts data visualization because we, no matter what data we have, even if it's big, we still want to visualize it. And there are some special issues uh, involving big data uh, that we want to consider when we're when we're doing data visualization. So I'm going to illustrate a little bit of that with two packages, uh, a little bit with Hexbin and a little bit longer with an experimental package developed by Harry Hadley Wickham called Big Viz, and actually the techniques that are involved, as you'll see, are not, they're not that different uh, or complex. They're not as complex as the pure computational issues involved with big data, uh, but we, we still have some things to think about. So for this exercise, uh, there's a data set on airline on-time performance data, and I believe you can still update this data uh, but I'm using one particular uh, version that was made available for an American Statistical Association competition, and that has all commercial flights within the U.S. from 1987 to 2008. There are, in that full data set, 120 million records, 12 gigabytes uncompressed. Um, so if you work with that level, that's that'll give you some practice working with truly big data. Um, and this data set addresses the on-time performance of flights, the departure, arrival, speed, some other conditions of you know how the, the flight was delayed. Um, we are going to work with an extract of the data. Um, if you look at something like, say, the 2008 data, one year of data, that's 689 megabytes and contains 7 million records. Uh, even that's a little bit big. You might want to try that. That's that's a good exercise to work with that as well. But for me to finish a short video and have my results pop up on screen, um, I'm using an extract of that. That's just one month of data. Now that's 37 and a half megabytes, 605,000 plus uh, flights represented there. So not too big, but enough to give you uh, the flavor of it. And so what we're going to do is in section 8, we're going to pull the data from, and I think I'm going to stop this. No, okay. Um, I, was, I was a little worried that my previous process was still running. Um, it's not. So I run this command to read the data from uh, my own website where I've hosted that sample file. We can inspect it with the head function that will show us that the data did in fact come in in a, in a proper format. We look, we're looking at the first six rows. You can see departures, arrivals, um, etc. We can look at the number of rows in the data set and the dimensions of the data set. There are actually 16 variables in this data set, so um, 605,765 times 16 is close to 10 million data points in the data set. So not, not small. And we're going to load a bunch of packages that we're going to work with. Now that the primary one that we're going to use here is this big viz package. This is not an official uh, CRAN package, so you're going to have to use the dev tools package to install it. Um, actually, you, that's also true of our charts, although I didn't make it explicit when we talked about that um, in the previous video. Uh, but just be aware, you have to run this command to install from the, from Hadley Wickham's GitHub site, pull the big viz package from there and install it. And 
I have had, this has been around, it was actually originally done a couple of years ago, and because it is not an official package, um, I have had my ability to run this go in and out over time, uh, where my R configuration didn't line up with the packages required. Everything seems to be working right now for me on my machine, but your mileage may vary. So just that's a little caution there. Um, so let's just load these packages up. And we are going to compute a few or, or assign a few simple variables for delay, distance, and time from pulling them from the airline data set just so that we don't have to uh, work with them in a long variable form. So first thing we'll do is plot the data and actually I need to make sure my lattice package is loaded. So a standard scatter plot in lattice is going to take a bit of time to pull up, especially in RStudio adds a bit of delay to any kind of graphics function compared to running it in native R, which I might want to do if this takes a little bit longer. There we go. So we've got our 700,000 points plotted there. A lot of overplotting, obviously, uh, in a data set this size, even more so than in our diamonds data. So we really don't have any idea of how many flights are in these sort of very dense clouds. We can see where it thins out a bit, but we we have some issues there, right? So that's actually the first very simple issue with big data is you've got more points than you know what to do with. You've got you don't have the ability to display that level of precision on the screen. Even if you have a very high resolution screen, you still only have a couple of million pixels to work with. You don't have 10 million or 100 million pixels. So you're going to have to do something to simplify that data. And one method is to use a hex bin. So hex bin plot command here um, responds more quickly because we're not actually plotting every single point. And we're dividing the graphical space into hexagonal regions and we can shade those by density. So we can see here that uh, and the scale is on the right. So the light gray are 10,000 and under flights uh, per cell. And we can actually see that the, for the vast majority of that area, we don't have that many observations. Um, it's really this narrow band of flights between, say, 100 miles and 1,000 miles and a relatively short time period that we have 50, 60, 70,000 flights all in there. So if we really wanted to graphically understand this, you know, that's a, an argument for zooming in on that section or understanding really what's going on. So that's one factor. That's all I'm going to say about the hex bin um, is we, it's one way to resolve these overplotting issues when you've got too many points all on top of each other. There are many other methods Hexpin is a nice convenient one that's that's available. All right, now I'm going to spend the rest of the time with a quick run through of big viz. And if you if you want further information about this package, there is a paper about it and a full presentation on it um, on the web that you can you can access and actually hear Hadley Wickham talk about it who does a much better job than I can as the creator of the package himself. So I encourage you, if you're inter interested in that, to to take a look there, and you'll you'll get the full works. Um, and again, this was developed a few years ago. Now I do want to uh, get this on video for posterity uh, because this example may not work forever. And all the code is on. Um, the the GitHub site. Now, I've seen some announcements or discussion on Twitter that this package is eventually going to come to to 
R as an official package uh, or some of the insights behind this will be used um, and so eventually that may that may turn up and replace this chunk of the, the presentation for me um, but the basic idea is to try to have some fast computation uh, that would process with this benchmark 100 million observations in under five seconds and produce usable graphical output with this fundamental principle that you can't plot anything more than the number of pixels on the screen and so you can reduce your data points to that level with no loss of any visual power um, so as I said this is a slightly simpler problem than some of the uh, computational issues behind working with big data. So what happens uh, in big in big viz is we have three main categories of operations. We condense the data and there are binning functions for that and condensing functions that were that Hadley wrote. There are smoothing functions. So if we want to smooth the data we have we have to do that taking into account that this is big data and it's we, we, we have to write something that will work at that scale and then we can visualize the data now that there's a auto plot function that is is built into this package that works with with big data plus y once you've condensed the data you can actually use standard methods from it and so the slideshow if you don't if you don't want to or are unable to run the package on your own computer um, some of the highlights are here in the slides. Um, I am going to try to run it in my own code uh, just so you can see how long this um, this takes. And I'm going to really kind of skim over because most of this is it's Hadley's code from his presentation that I have um, just tweaked ever so slightly to make sure that it works with my smaller data example. So we are looking for cleaning the data up in the beginning. We, we look for the number of uh, data that has some missing values and there's a few of those. Um, we compare to see whether the missing data is in any way different than the data that is is present and it is. Uh, these two, two curves compare that. So that'll be something we want to deal with. We condense the data in the next step and again not really going into the coding but this is our raw distribution here of the the condensed data and we're going to see it smoothed in just just a bit you notice that at least for this smaller extract this runs pretty quickly these steps take a few seconds to come back with the result so here we're um, looking for the optimal smoothing characteristics we don't want to just sort of smooth it without testing uh, the parameters that we want to smooth by. And so you'll, you'll notice if you run these that there's a slight delay. If you run it on the larger year-long data set, these are things that will chew up a little bit of processor time. And so we are you know, basically minimizing the mean squared error We'll see when this one comes back. This is taking a bit longer. I do like to prove that you know this is work that can be done live and so that took more like 15 seconds and came back with the result and so now we can plot that. Um, this is just a diagnostic plot and let's move on to where we plot the smoothed data coming up 
here. Here's the smooth data. So you can see the difference uh, between this original data and the smooth data, which has considerably evened out the, um, the results. So this is a method that works on very large data sets. We can, we can work on many, many observations and, and smooth the data like that. So that's one advance of this package. And just, again, my intent here is to kind of run through the, the code quickly and show you the, the main point. Um, and here we are looking at a density cloud of the flights. So as we saw between um, 100 and 1,000 miles were most of the flights, sort of the on-time flights flying at standard speeds um, are the dense part of this cloud. And then we have some outliers here. And it's kind of interesting in, in Hadley's talk, you know, he's talking about um, for the long flights, you know, there's sort of an upper bound here. This will become clearer when the graph uh, becomes colored later, but there's an upper bound of about 600 miles per hour of the of the flights. Um, but when we look at this graph, we see that there are some flights that mysteriously uh, go really fast over short distances, 700, almost 800 miles an hour, and there's an argument to be made for trimming that data out. We trim out the, the outliers because there's probably something misreported in the time there that's, that's causing it to appear to be fast when the flight is actually not so fast. Um, and so this is the, the colored version of that distribution where we're highlighting the, the outliers a bit more. And, and then the, the trimming function peels off the, the most extreme half a percent of data. And that actually makes a lot of sense here. It looks like it, it, it comes up with a much more reasonable cloud of times because, you know, when you have a, a flight that is just taking off and landing over a short distance, it never reaches a very high average speed. It should look something like this. This is a little bit better. And then we can actually um, shade the, the density in different ways. Uh, to visualize it, and essentially this is this is the the result that we're looking for. We're looking for some way to characterize these many 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 flights and plot them in a kind of a density map on the screen, and that's what what has happened here. Uh, we're doing it with the the toy example of one month. These are just a few other uh, plots that you can do to explore the distribution of the data. Uh, one with contours as well. So those are all things that are available methods. And let me leave it at that. Let me leave you with this image of the, the flight, the distribution of flight times. And refer you to Hadley's presentation for further detail of that. Um, the, the point is that this kind of code works not only on this toy example, but if we did have the time to load and process the, the full massive airline data set, it would work there as well. Um, and so that is something quite, quite useful. So, you know, I think Part of the message of this presentation is that these methods are rapidly evolving. They are getting easier to use. They are becoming more powerful. And the, that big 
power, the this example of a package that you can very quickly get in and work with what used to be really big data sources, uh, shows you that this power is becoming more accessible to everybody. And whether you use R or not, or you're using some other software environment, that's just something to know and to take advantage of, uh, because that's, I think, going to be an expectation. Uh, finally, I'm going to leave you with some links to other sites that have some very interesting, inspiring graphics for you to look at. You can explore those. A uh, fun one is the YouTube Trends Map, which shows you uh, for all around uh, any country that you choose to explore, you can see the hot videos uh, by different demographic groups at the moment um, in each location, and you can you know see what your favorite demographic likes to watch. Um, just and this is an example of a live visualization dashboard. Uh, that is processing a huge amount of data. Uh, so this is both big data, this is mapping, this is glyphs, right? We're using symbols to represent the videos, so we've, we're using a lot of the concepts that we've covered in, in this series. And just an example of you know, how that data visualization technique makes new information accessible that was not before. Um, there are some other topics that I am interested in exploring in the future, and you might get there before me, uh, but we haven't talked about uh, some issues that people do, do mention, which is most of our graphical techniques don't indicate um, the degree of uncertainty or the degree of problems with the data that may exist. So we plot what we know. We don't plot uh, information about the missing data very often but that can be important. We don't have ways of sort of blurring the edges of zones that we're not confident about. We don't have information about, whereas keeping the, uh, the lines clear when we have a lot of data, a lot of information. Uh, so skagnostics is one um, area of investigation that deals with that. Uh, these are all concepts that are, are interesting to think about for the future. So I really encourage you to, to keep exploring, keep digging, um, have fun learning. Um, a lot of my ideas just come from browsing and reading around. If you have one place you want to start, you can follow the R Bloggers website, which compiles lots of interesting blogs on R topics, and a lot of those are visualization topics. Um, again, I've got a link to the references that I've mentioned throughout this series and so I hope you'll you'll again have fun 